Earlier this week, I went into Copper Center for one final check of the mailbox. As you may have seen in my previous video, I received two feet of snow with the very first storm that came through. Since then, there have been several smaller ones that have dropped a few more inches. But winter is fast approaching and I am not one for driving on these roads in the winter time. Decision that that would be the last of it until spring. So if you have something that you've sent to me and I have not yet received it, I apologize if it gets sent back to you, but I want to say thank you to everyone who has sent things in so far, including Nance over at Buckeye Bigfoot, who sent me a large box full of goodies from myself and Kenai. These things are fabulous and I do appreciate them and I'm very much looking forward to opening these Christmas gifts. So thank you, Nance. Now that I'm back in the cabin, over the last couple days, I've been thinking a lot about the channel. This channel has only been up for a year now, and I've noticed a reoccurring theme in the comments. And that typically starts with the cabin. There is a romanticism about living in a cabin, and yet there's also, you know, comments that come in that say, you're, that's not a cabin, that's a house. Or I've made the comment where I say house and someone replies back, but you live in a cabin, you don't live in a house. It, there's nothing set in stone as to what people call a cabin. I've heard people say, oh, I'm gonna head off to the cabin. And it might actually be just a small home, stick belt located just on the outskirts of town. It might be a log cabin set up on a mountaintop all alone. <laughs> or it might be a little bungalow set on some beachside resort. For me, this is a log cabin. My home was built with D logs and is not a stick built home. So this is a cabin. It just happens to be a large cabin by some people's standards. But I don't want to get to the point where before you know it, homesteaders are going to have to put in their pronouns, if you will, in their about page. Cabin, homestead, cottage. I guess there is already that though, right? There are people that say they have that cottage core aesthetic. I digress. And I know I'm being goofy, but there is a point to this. And the point is, is that one of the other things that comes up as one of the most reoccurring questions is, are you off grid or you can't be off grid because you have electricity. And I think again, that off grid can be quite subjective as well because you can be off grid and be in the city. You can be off grid, but still be on grid in other ways. For example, I'm on the road system. So in that aspect, I'm on grid. I do have electricity that was brought into my cabin by the original owners. So I'm on the electric grid. If you have a cell phone, but you're not tied into the local utilities, otherwise you're still on the grid. So it is one of those subjective terms that's being used very loosely these days. I use the electricity to power my freezers, the lights, my computers, and whatever batteries I need to charge for say my chainsaw or power tools such as a drill. My cabin is not set up with all the amenities. I don't have a TV that I'm sitting down in front of each night to watch a movie with friends and family. I don't have a refrigerator or a stove. I don't have a washer and dryer. I don't have a furnace or a hot water heater. And speaking of my freezers, one of the other questions that I get quite frequently is how do I plan for the months that I'm going to be homebound and what happens if my freezers lose electricity? What you may not know if you're new to this channel is, is that I have experienced a power outage of some duration, whether it's just a blink of an eye power outage or it's lasting for several hours, at least once a week for the past year that I've been here. Every single week I've had a power outage. 
to some degree. In the summer months, it's a bit more concerning. The way that I combat the power outages in the summer months are with these ice packs. These ice packs are from Bass Pro. Out of all the ice packs I've ever purchased, those from Bass Pro are the very best that I've ever had. And they do a great job of keeping things cold in the warm, warmer months when the power goes out. In the winter time, this room is not heated and it is about probably 45 degrees in here right now. But I also pack extra insulation into my freezers as well as I have um, some covers that I have for them that will reflect the cold back in, keep the heat out, and keep things from thawing out too quickly. To this point in time, I've not actually had anything spoil in my freezers, which is a good thing. One of the other questions is, how do I plan for all those months when I'm gonna be stuck in the cabin? Well, since I only shop twice a year, and I did that even before moving up to Alaska, I did that in Colorado as well, I know what my consumption patterns are, I know the things that I'm typically am going to eat, and I can plan accordingly based upon the number of weeks and the number of meals that there are in a six month period. There's 26 weeks in a six month period and 26 times seven, I just do the math and I figure out how many of certain ingredients I'm going to need to carry me through that time period. But I also live very frugally, such as Creative Lori does and Not So Remote Alaska. If you're into frugal living, those are two channels that I really recommend that you check out because they know their stuff. They are very, very cost conscious shoppers and I have learned quite a bit from them um, in the times that I've been watching their channels. In addition to that, I do hedge against inflation by shopping this way. Because I buy all at once, if the prices go up over the next six months, I'm not constantly paying that increase. I will pay it eventually when I get back to shopping again for the next run, but I do hedge against inflation by pre-buying my groceries. One of the other questions that I got was regarding these shelves behind me, which I recently built. There was some concern about them toppling over in an earthquake. As you may or may not know, Alaska gets over a thousand earthquakes a year, averaging about 33 a day. However, in the area where I live, earthquakes are not that common. They are more apt to happen if you're down on the coast, say by Anchorage or on the Kenai Peninsula, in the Aleutian Islands you know, in the ring of fire is more where you're gonna see those earthquakes happen. They do happen in the interior, but not as frequently as they do along the ring of fire. These shelves, when I built them, I did actually uh, attach them to some headers up in the rafters, and I actually attached them at the floor as well with some L brackets. So these shelves are really stable. They're not going anywhere. If they come down, the cabin's coming down around them. People were concerned about how am I gonna prevent things from coming off the shelf should there be an earthquake. Well, using these metal trays that I have in here has aided in that as well because the trays are loaded down so things are not going to, the whole tray's not gonna come sliding out very easily. But the other thing is, is that I will be applying some bungee cords here um, to prevent anything from falling off the shelves, though, I do need to stop double stacking things um, because you know this is more apt to topple off than the bottom one. So that's how I'm addressing the earthquake situation here. In the kitchen, however, I, when I did some renovation in there, I took out the plumbing and I'm using the old copper pipes to basically create a ledge on the shelves so that things can't slide off from there. When it comes to how I plan on securing things in the kitchen, I plan on drilling holes in the shelf to accommodate these eye bolts. And then through the eye bolt, I plan on running a piece of copper pipe. And as I mentioned, I just recently renovated the kitchen, but I also renovated this room. Originally, when this cabin was built, this room was a bedroom. And then the next owners turned it into a bathroom I ripped out all of those fixtures and made it the pantry that you see today. But you're probably asking, wait, you ripped out your bathroom? Did you make a new one? 
are you using that outhouse? Well, before I get to those questions, let's talk about where I am off grid. And that is with my water. I live in a dry cabin, meaning that I don't have water being piped into the property. I don't have a well on the property yet. Hopefully in the future, I'll get one. But at this moment, there's no water coming in and I don't have any plumbing to take any black or gray water out of the cabin. When I purchased this, yes, there was plumbing here, but I did remove all of the plumbing this summer and I did it for a couple of various reasons. One, I'm just not a fan of indoor plumbing. One is if you get a leak, it can be very devastating to your property. Two is if you've ever had a septic system or a sewage line back up, your main drain becomes clogged with a tree root or something that happened to make it down the toilet that shouldn't have, what have you, a clog in your sink, I'm just not one for dealing with those things. So I took those things out. But also because the pipes that were here in the cellar, they were not doing a great job. And yes, I could have put them back in, but as I mentioned, not being a fan of indoor plumbing, I didn't see the need to go through that expense. The pipes were set at an incorrect grade and didn't allow for proper drainage. Behind the cabin and off to the side, I have a log crib, which is a septic system, and I have a French drain. The log crib is about 40 years old, if not older. The French drain is about 20 years old. And those two things, I cannot guarantee what condition they're in. I don't have access to the log crib. And in order to investigate it, I have to dig it up. It needs to be serviced at least once a year is my understanding and I don't know when the last time it was serviced. The French drain, I don't think was doing what it needed to because if I dumped water down the previous kitchen sink that was here, a lot of times that water didn't go anywhere and it was backing up into the kitchen sink. In the winter time, the pipes froze even though I had them plugged in with heat tape. So in my opinion, it just wasn't worth it. But that also does cause for some challenges here. Because I live in a dry cabin, it means that I'm having to haul in my water, which I do with five gallon jerry cans. And then I store that water here on the property in 55 gallon drums. One is set up next to the wood stove and then I have three others that are in the Arctic entry. The Arctic entry is not heated so I do have some heat wrap that I can uh, utilize if it gets cold enough in there to cause that water to freeze but it's that water is there for these winter months. I also have two I think they're 14 gallon tanks that I am using for my kitchen um, so that I have running water in there. You may have seen in one of my previous videos about the kitchen renovation that I don't have a kitchen sink anymore. My kitchen sink is just a couple large metal bowls and I was using a hand pump that you have to crank in order to get water out. Let's head out to the kitchen and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This faucet is the most basic and inexpensive thing to install. Unfortunately, it requires one hand to operate it and the minute you stop manipulating the crank on it, no more water comes out. So it's not really the best option for me. And thanks to some of my viewers who suggested I get a marine grade foot pump, I'm gonna go ahead and swap that out today for a different faucet and we're gonna give this a try. So I'm gonna walk you through that process and show you what the new faucet looks like. When I installed this faucet, I needed to create an opening in the counter large enough to accommodate the pump mechanism. And not having a hole saw, I just drilled a hole and then used a jigsaw to cut through there. Then the new faucet, it doesn't fit. 
I got a little clever and I'm using an old plate from an old piece of door hardware. Um, I just went ahead and spray painted it copper so it matches the new faucet. I'm going to just set that right over the counter and then the new faucet will sit directly over that. Um, once I get it positioned, it'll sit up firmly and it'll no one will be the wiser that there's a bigger hole there under the counter. Most of my videos don't have a moral to them. It's just whatever's occurring at the time. Uh, this one has a moral. Do your homework. <laughs> don't cut corners. So I went ahead and installed a couple of steel plates underneath so that the washers for the faucet have some place to secure to. So I'm just going to go ahead and cover up that opening with this plate, which I've gone ahead and spray painted a copper color to match the faucet. The faucet will slide down into here and this will cover up that hole in the sill of the counter. And then I will secure everything underneath um, with the washers. Definitely need another set of hands here. When all else fails, get creative. And so I'm going to use a hairband to hold this here. And I'm going to use another one. To hold this here. All right, that will at least hold it till I can get underneath and attach the washers and the cold water hose. What a fiasco. I wish I'd done it right the first time. <laughs> So I was saying earlier that the moral of the story is to do your homework because this is all the tubing I have available to me if I want the excess of this to hit the bottom of the water tank on the other side. This is what's now connected to the faucet. This is what's run into my storage tank. I need to split this and if I want to access the foot pump from outside of the counter, logically. I need to have this attached to the inlet and outlet valves on this foot pump. Uh, I'm not a big fan of having these dangle like this. Um, I would rather be able to tuck them up and run them down along the back side of the leg here, but I don't have enough tubing to do that. I'm glad I got as long of a piece of a tubing as I originally did, but I think I'm going to have to purchase some more to complete this project. I went ahead and split the tubing that was originally run to the faucet. So now I have one for the input and the output ports. The problem is this is 3 8 diameter, interior diameter, and I need half inch, I think, on this. And so I'm gonna go ahead and boil some water so that I can um, expand this tubing and then get it to fit over this. So always something. This is the most jerry-rigged thing I've ever done. Need to expand this tubing from three eighths to half inch. So I've just boiled some water and I am taking a clothespin, which has a conal shape and wedging that over it to expand it. All right, so I've got the hose, got my hose clamp on so I can attach it when ready. I've got the hose pushed onto the clothespin so that I have an opening that is closer to the opening of the port on the uh, foot pump. 
So at least I've got the hose started on here and now I just need to feed it down further and then secure my hose clamp and do the same thing to the other port right there. Well, after much, uh, after much ado, let's just say that, I have running water and I don't have to use my hands. Look, Ma, no hands. And I can move the faucet anywhere I need to. So this is just a cold water pot filler and I'm very happy. So now I can add cold water to do my dishes or I can wash my hands. So thank you to everybody who made this suggestion. I really appreciate it. So now you know how I am getting running water for doing dishes. I also heat water up in a water bath canner on top of the wood stove and that works out phenomenally. Drinking water gets stored in those five gallon jerry cans and then processed through a Berkey filter. But now let's talk about wastewater. What do I do with the dirty dishwater? All of that gets dumped into a five gallon bucket and then I walk this bucket out into the woods and dump it far away from the cabin. In the winter months, I'm not going quite as far away, but it this is my slop bucket is what I call it. I have no problem with carrying it off into the woods or rain, snow or shine. It makes no difference to me. I'd rather deal with that moment of inconvenience than have to deal with the expense of a water leak or a backup into my property. So this is how I'm disposing of wastewater. So that's how I'm handling wastewater. Now let's talk about some other waste. No, I'm not using that outhouse. <laughs> the outhouse is only used to empty my composting toilet, which is just a glorified bucket system here in the cabin. I'm not gonna show you it, but I will tell you that the secret to a composting toilet is to use a urine diverter. If you keep the two separated and you cover your matter with a dry substance such as wood ash or sawdust, coffee grounds, coconut core, something like that, typically you're not gonna have an odor in your cabin. So that's the secret to using a composting toilet. And then as far as how am I bathing? Wouldn't you like to know? Actually, no, when it comes to bathing, I have a Zodi, which is just a cylindrical tank that I set either on top of a, a stand and heat it with a propane flame or I put it on top of the wood stove and then I can carry that out and I can use that as a shower. Though during the winter months what I do is I use a stock tank, I set it up in front of the wood stove and I bathe that way. I stay nice and warm. I'm able to relax. I can look out the window and enjoy the stars in the night sky or the snow falling, depending upon the time of day. And to be honest with you, the baths that I've taken here are the best baths I've ever had. They're the most relaxing and I couldn't be happier with it. So I know for a lot of people that would not be ideal, 
but I don't mind it. My bath water also gets carried out in these buckets and dumped off into the woods as well. <clears throat> I do plan on building a bathroom in the Arctic entry. That bathroom will be a shower sauna combination. I will continue to use a composting toilet in there and the sink will be a dry sink like what I have in the kitchen. So no plumbing is going to be added back into this cabin. I do have one other area where I use water though, and that is with my laundry. I do not have a washer and dryer in this cabin. I don't live a life of luxury and I don't have a whole lot of amenities here. So everything I do does take a bit more work and a bit more time to do. The point being is that cabin life is different for everybody. And there's also this romanticism over living the simple life. This is not simple living. There is nothing simple about what happens when you live the lifestyle that I live. Everything has a greater workload attached to it. And I'm perfectly okay with that. When it comes to doing laundry, I use two metal wash bins and a mangle in between the two of them. And it works out just fine for me. I have done laundry at laundromats and I find that my clothes just don't get as clean as when I'm hand washing them. Even the same thing when I had, you know, conventional washer and dryer back in Colorado, I was never satisfied with the cleanliness of my clothes. I always felt like they were dingy looking or they didn't smell that fresh, you know, when you took them out of the dryer and what have you. But by doing them by hand, I'm get the cleanest clothes I've ever had. They smell fresh and I am drying those clothes on a clothesline here in the cabin during the winter months and outdoors during the summer months. I do plan on installing a proper clothesline though this next summer. If you're curious about how I do the laundry specifically, um, I will leave links at the end of this video for that video where I show that. And then also if you're curious about my laundry detergent recipe, which you can see stored up there. Um, you can check that out in the other video. I'll link at the end. That isn't the only waste that living this lifestyle produces. Every one of us accumulates or every one of us produces trash throughout our day and I'm no different and I need to dispose of that trash somehow. And I have a couple of different ways in which I do that. Anything that can burn such as paper and cardboard food waste, all of that gets burnt in a, the old wood stove that used to be in this cabin, but is now set out on the edge of the property. I burn it all. And I'm very thankful that that wood stove is there because I'm not having to use a burn bin and I don't really have to baby it too much. I light it and I keep an eye on it, but I'm not having to babysit it. And it does a great job of eliminating all that waste. For things that shouldn't be burnt or can't be burnt, those things I have a couple of different options for. The first option is to take them into a transfer station. The nearest transfer station for me is about a hundred miles away and so I don't make it there very often. It would be typically when I'm heading into town to do my grocery shopping, which again is about twice a year. All the things that can't be burnt, they just get stored in these plastic trash cans with a lid on them. And that would be things like tin cans 
or glass bottles, plastic, things like that that I'm not comfortable burning here at the cabin. I know I can burn plastic. I just typically choose not to because I don't want that left in my soil where the ashes from the paper and the cardboard go. The transfer station has varying cost. I've displayed a picture here on screen so you can go ahead and see that. It's very easy to use. You just put your trash into the appropriate bin. Depending upon what it is, there is some battery recycling and things like that here as well. And then you go down across the road and you pay the fee depending upon what you were disposing of. There is also a dump just in Glen Allen. However, the dump is only open two days a week for just a few hours. And when I renovated the kitchen and the bathroom, I amassed a lot of debris from that. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to dispose of that debris at the dump. I needed to get a roll off essentially to take the stuff away. And being in a small community, the dump only had a couple of roll offs available and they were being rented out for the entirety of, well, until next spring, essentially. So my only other option at that moment was to burn what I could and to hold the rest until spring when I can get a dump trailer out here and get the stuff hauled away. So I have a bonfire pit on my property and I burnt as much of the wood debris that came out of the kitchen as I possibly could. Some things get reutilized for other projects down the road if they're still in good condition and that's how I handle waste here at the property. So I did want to provide an update also to everybody on the wood shed. I did get another three cords in here and I still have some room across from me here on the other side of the woodshed where I could get um, probably another cord in here. But I also wanted to make an offering to Minor Dawn. Minor Dawn, if you're interested, I have some slightly used tarps that I can send your way. Just let me know and I'll get these off to you in the spring so you and the rest of Faz can put these to good use. Until next time, I hope everyone stays safe and takes care. Stick around for these outtakes and I will catch you on the next one. Don't get any ideas. The main thing is, is that I know what my consumption patterns are. And so I base all of my planning around that. Outside, what is in my shirt? Are you kidding me? Peekaboo, microphone, top anybody? <laughs> <clears throat> Way to lose your train of thought. Distraction. All right, where was I?